Well, you've made it this far, um, and I'm afraid that at this point, uh, rather than letting you sit back and take in some more information about quarantine over the ages, I'm going to make you work a little bit. Uh, apologies. Um, so I just want to say um, uh, I have a slight apology to make in that, uh, unlike many of the other people, many other people, including our last speaker, I have uh, very little skin in the game, as it were. I am not an expert uh, on quarantine, and I am not. I have never really. I've, the closest I've got to to frontline is is running um, or being the, the, the GP in the flu clinic at St Thomas's uh, uh, during two uh, two pandemics, a swine flu pandemic and a and a, uh, uh, and a subsequent one. So the idea here is uh, that um, I'm completely happy for people to. Uh, Photograph, tweet, discuss online. If you do, though, please use my Twitter handle, that's at Gentlemedic. And if you're inspired to ask further questions and, uh, and, and think about your own practice subsequently, then please do come along for the next year of our course. Um, and uh, Maria Perrin will be around to, to give you the information about that. So what I'm going to do is, I've already apologised uh, but I'm going to start with a brief reminder about how to think like an ethicist. Uh, I'm going to rehearse uh, what we've already talked about, the meaning of quarantine as opposed to isolation. Uh, then I'm going to talk about some of the ethical issues that have arisen so far today, um, including um, quarantine effectiveness, uh, quarantine desirability, some questions and principles for doing the quarantine well. Uh, and then uh, invite some reflections going forward. So the first thing that I would like you to do is I would like you to turn to the person next to you, um, introduce yourself if you don't know them, and just for the next couple of minutes, I just would like you just to talk to the other person about what is it about a thing that makes you think, aha, there's a moral ethical issue here. What is it that signals that there is something that needs further discussion. Individuals' interests 
Example uh, relevant here of two principles in conflict. Any any other examples? Okay. Okay. So clearly. Oh. Absolutely. So sustainability as a subset of wider consequences. Okay. Um, any anyone else want to volunteer anything for I Tim? Yeah, so the, the whole issue of stigma from blame and responsibility and perhaps injustice in that responsibility as well, because you could argue that some people are not responsible for some things, but others arguably are responsible for others. So I'm just going to uh, put up a, a list. Now, I do this as an exercise in various different forms, whether it's teaching a group of um, anaesthetists or teaching a group of GPs. And in general terms, we always come up with this set of broad um, ideas. So it usually maps onto this in some way. So some idea of conflict, disagreement, or lack of consensus. I think we've had that in spades so far today. Uncertainty about the right thing to do. Again, if there's evidential uncertainty that can contribute to it. Dilemmas, duties that require different actions. So there's a, a, a duty to respect persons set against a duty to maximize welfare or, or minimize harm. Actions that have been identified by others as ethically perilous. So this is why when I ask a medical student what's medical ethics, they go, abortion and euthanasia. Um, obviously all medical ethics is an abortion and euthanasia. Um, but things like overriding autonomy, overriding liberty and overriding confidentiality have been held up by the people that have taught us mostly uh, as being um, ethically perilous. So, deeper reflection, you want deeper reflection, you want to know why those things are. And this, the idea here is that this quarantine is something that's quite extreme. Um, so again, actions that are only sanctioned in exceptional circumstances, you need to think about what is exceptional and what is not. So we come back to the ways, apologies for the shameless plug, um, about the, the ways we think about right and wrong, um, certainly in uh, the Anglo-American West. So we, again, a lot of it comes back to the 18th century, the idea of duties, the idea of doing the right thing, uh, is the right thing always and everywhere, uh, and that it stems from the idea of respecting persons, uh, and the idea of do, do as you would be done by uh, very much uh, links to that. So that's one way of thinking about doing good. Uh, you do. The, the, the thing that is good is the thing that you would always wish to happen uh, universally, and the thing that's bad is the thing that you would never wish should be uh, a general rule. So you should always tell the truth and you should never lie, according to that. Um, you too, there is the idea of maximising benefit, minimising harm, whether you call that consequentialism, utilitarianism, great doses of that in our National Health Service. Um, in in education, there's the idea of being the best kind of doctor, nurse, citizen, uh, and that is towards the flourishing life. So there's this idea of virtues that goes back way beyond the 18th century, back into antiquity and beyond. And actually, um, post people like Thomas Hobbes, uh, there is this idea that we actually live um, within a society and there is a social contract. So the idea that if we, we need to have rules that will produce a society that we wish to live in, uh, and if, if there isn't some way of enforcing those, we will live in a society where life is not nasty, brutish, poor and short. Apologies if I par paraphrase that in the wrong order. And of course there's various other ways, but the, the reason I want to flag that is I want you to be having those thoughts when considering everything that we've thought so far of so far today, 
and also the things that I'm going to briefly touch on before we have our final discussion. So then we come back to clarifying some definitions, and I've bor borrowed these from a general practitioner and public health physician in Canada, Ross Upshaw, that some of you may uh, uh, be familiar with his work. Um, and this is the idea that, as we've already heard, there is a, a smart distinction between quarantine and isolation. The two are trying to do different things. We've had various definitions of quarantine, and I think this is just a, a brief summary of all that, that we have heard so far. So the separation of those exposed individuals who are not yet symptomatic uh, for a period of time, usually the known incubation period uh, of the suspected pathogen to determine whether they will develop symptoms. And uh, there are two goals here, um, and there is potential for insincerity amongst those two goals. Firstly, there is the stopping of the chain of transmission because it's less possible to affect others if one is not in social circulation. Um, the other is that it allows individuals under surveillance to be identified and directed towards appropriate care. Now, of course, that's conditional on what your attitude is and how you impose uh, or encourage people to go into quarantine. Um, and again, we've talked about um, isolation, and I think that's something separate, and, we've, and I think I'll focus mainly on quarantine as opposed to isolation. So, um, before I move on to the next slide, just a quick shout out. What are the kinds of things that quarantine might involve? What, what, what happens with quarantine? I mean, we've had some very, very graphic examples given to us so far. If you go into a, a special place, a yeah. special area where they're kept to, mm -hmm. to observe, hopefully uh, that area gives them dignity and comfort mm -hmm. uh, so that what we're trying to do for public health is not destroying their dignity. Absolutely. So uh, the, a variety of, of measures which range from voluntary isolation um, to uh, more legalistic forms of isolation, uh, where breach of that isolation, you saw the picture of the soldier chasing the girl, um, might be met with fines, punishment, um, or people being um, shot. Uh, so again, the, the, the question is, is, is if, if an area is going to be policed with people with live ammunition, then is that something that's going to be expected? Uh, but also the idea of using surveillance devices and cameras, um, tracing people with uh, wearable devices, uh, or actually physically locking people up so, so there is actually no physical possibility of them going uh, into the general circulation. So this sort of maps on to, and I'm sorry I don't have a diagram of it, but uh, the Nuffield Council for Bioethics uh, did a fantastic document which is free online on the ethics of public health. And they've got a public health intervention ladder which goes from do nothing, which is at the extremes of freedom and uh, to take away choice completely. Uh, and you can map that ladder onto quarantine uh, amongst various other um, public health interventions. So I've seen it used in terms of management of obesity and also in terms of um, interventions towards control of smoking. But it applies <coughs> So why is quarantine worth, ooh, this is, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. so, okay, the, the perils of updating the slides. So, <laughs> so um, I, I was, I was there, is a, there is a serious point to, to this picture. Um, so one of the things that has struck me is that particularly Western society, is absolutely full of stories which tap into the fear of quarantine type situations. So Brad Pitt, World War Z, I think is a lovely example. It's, it's a, a real sort of paranoia fest of a contagion uh, that uh, someone is exposed and very quickly they become a, a drooling, salivating monster out to kill, eat everybody else. Um, and I, I think 
I'm looking directly at, at, at Arup because in Arup's presentation, we were talking earlier about disease. I don't think you're a zombie, Arup. I was just going to say that. But, but in your presentation, you actually point out that, that a contagious disease is implicated in the entire destruction of a civilization and the irreverse, irreversible changes to subsequent civilizations. So this is something that we see portrayed in recent mass media. So there is that fairly pervasive fear, um, whether we're talking about any dreadfuls like Dracula in the 19th century or, or blockbusters involving uh, you know, Brad Pitt. So that brings me on to my next question for you. Why might people object to being quarantined? Do you have a shout out? So, so, okay, so inconvenience, we've got inconvenience. Stigma. Stigma. Social and economic consequent dislocation as well. And there's a huge fear in the West where people are usually a few patients away from <laughs> impoverishment. Yeah. So de depending on which situation you're in, it could be an inconvenience or it could, it could be um, livelihood ending or career ending. So we've been talking about the empty school. What ramifications does that have for the teacher? Risk to self. So your assumption is you're wrong. Uh, so everyone else around you has got the problem. And then you'll put into that situation and then it's a risk to yourself. So again, the, the, if you presumably you're being quarantined, you're going to be quarantined in a place where other people are being quarantined. So there's, uh, and again, there was another, there was another slightly sort of scarier picture I thought about using uh, of another horror film called Quarantine, where people are in with each other and they sort of get each other as well. Um, so there's, okay, any other, any other thoughts? Fear that you'll find out that you actually do have that thing. I yeah, mean, that's absolutely. That's a scary one and you might Naturally, if it's a vital thing, you might choose the night a period of time over, over one of the knowledge times. It's terrifying. So here's a list I prepared earlier. Um, so obviously up there, um, fear of fear, risk of catching the disease, or fear of the risk of catching the disease, loss of liberty, loss of income, social isolation, harms from types of enforcement. Uh, fear of unjust discrimination, disenfranchisement, um, and also perceived unfairness uh, as well. And we could add to that list. So there are the fact that there are that there are many reasons. Why, and of course, um, other ob objections might be: I don't believe that this is a contagious illness. So it could be a difference of belief as well. We're going to uh, come on to that. And infringement of my civil liberties surely would be a yeah. complaint of some people. Yeah, so I, I, have, I have some contractarian rights as a result of living <coughs> in this society, which I pay my taxes to, and, and therefore that has been uh, breached. So, again, some people, as we heard earlier from the lady in front, um, see quarantine as, a, a, as an unwarranted diminution of their personal liberty. Others see it as an integral aspect of um, communicable disease control. Now, one of the things that's come out so far today is actually the different stakeholders. So, this morning we had a, uh, a, a almost in the in the epic tradition uh, of, of of Homer, we had a sort of a song to the heroic action uh, of the brave doctor. Um, and and just now we've we've had a personal perspective from both looking at both the perspective of the patient and the practitioner as well. Um, we've had the perspective of the, the, the people who own the ships. We've had the perspective of the butchers. Um, so again, actually recognising that someone may have uh, <coughs> interests and those interests may conflict is just the starting point. But actually, the, the other aspect of that is that all of these people may also have responsibilities as well. So some of the uh, literature on the ethics of infectious disease control and quarantine uh, talks about the, the issues concerning those people who have their civil liberties, but they also have duties as well 
to comply with the laws of the countries that provide them with those civil liberties. So, um, particularly um, Harrison Home and, and Jubilee et al. would say that there is an argument that people ought to comply with quarantine by virtue of being citizens of a country that has that um, as part of their laws and framework. And if they resist it, it's akin to complying with laws against theft or laws against not murdering people, then it's the legitimate role of the state to, um, to enforce uh, that expected citizenship. The RDO might have a particular view on this too, <laughs> because it was from there, wasn't it, that the slaves were taken to the sugar fields in America. There's a, there's a history of um, suppression of those people. I'm, I'm going to come to that this point. Sorry. Um, so this, this brings us on to the context. So it's a good thought. I appreciate it. So again, are we talking about quarantine within a high income country, like Canada, SARS? Uh, are, and again, it's interesting to think about how different countries respond um, to epidemics. How, in, how, if someone might compare the different attitudes, say, uh, between sort of uh, uh, Canada and the other places where um, SARS uh, was seen. Within a low or middle income country, and again, uh, the, it, interesting to hear about how there was an element of uh, kind of nimbyism amongst the relatives of our last speaker. You know, how, how could you possibly go over there and risk yourself for them over there and then come back and risk us over here? Um, and also the element of, well, how can we go and restrict their freedom over there? Because they're cynically, actually, the reason we're, some would say we're restricting them over there is to protect us over here. Uh, whether it's something that's imposed by country's own authorities or something that's linked to trade. So early, just now we've heard about uh, shipping. Uh, and whether it's something that's there in the everyday course of shipping. Um, so you've gone somewhere which is just considered more unhygienic. There's going to be a quarantine period. And um, there was talk about quarantine of animals. And again, that resonated for me um, because we temporarily moved to Greece uh, as a family, uh, and it was a one-way ticket for our beloved uh, Labrador retriever called Poppy, uh, because we couldn't, in good conscious, conscience, put up a quarantine uh, on the way back. So when we came back, she stayed. Um, uh, I uh, uh, changed my phone, otherwise I'd show you some cute photos. Um, again, there's the, this idea of cooperation and sort of buying. So, in Canada, one of the things that uh, Ross Upshaw talks about is the sheer level of voluntary self-quarantine. Um, and yet, it's the people who breach that that make it into the news. And so there's BBC News flipping of Canadian health ministers talking about changing people to beds. But actually, the, the sort of the story on the ground is, is actually of many more people actually volunteering um, to stay at home. Um, and then there's this idea of fear and mistrust. So movies like World War Z, um, etc., etc. You know, I was I was trying to think of I was trying to get a, a good clip, and I was trying to think how can I get a good clip from the movie Alien, where actually there's a there's a the the, the doctor who we, we later learn as a robot with ulterior motives actually takes someone out of quarantine, uh, who later turns out to be incubating uh, a alien monster that massacres. Uh, and again, uh, sorry if I spoiled the plot. Um, so I think that the context does matter and it does give a flavour to the ethical discussion that we should be aware of. And the, the questions about what we should do about them. So, question number one does quarantine work? Which is an empirical question which has obvious ethical implications. Because if it doesn't work, it's, uh, it's arguably unethical to do it un unless there is some other compelling reason. So I'm just thinking about what is the reason why um, if there was overwhelming evidence that it wasn't appropriate that the US authorities might have had such an overt sort of um, dragon slaying mentality to the returning Ebola workers and anyone who'd been to West Africa. 
And then there's the question of assuming that it does work, is in principle should society impose quarantine um, or, and should individuals submit to it? And again that then leads to the further question, if it's accepted in principle, is there an ethical way in which to implement it? So again, so how much evidence is needed for the effectiveness of quarantine? And certainly uh, in a lot of documents produced in the West, effectiveness is a feature used to justify instances of it. Except if we've learned anything from our historical uh, uh, explorations, um, it's that where diseases arise, very often they do arise in a, an atmosphere of uncertainty, uncertainty about etiology, uh, uncertainty regarding the provision of, uh, of support, investigations, etc. So if it's a question of it, evidence of absence, I think, is quite useful, but absence of evidence um, is something entirely different. And if you know, if you know that quarantine may work, um, it's easier to justify temporary limits <coughs> that turn out to be unnecessary than to justify uh, the end of your civilization. So, on the side of public safety, and if we flip that on to the duties that might um, be offered to, to citizens to, to comply, it's compared to the duty of easy rescue. So, the duty of easy rescue um, for consequentialists is if you're walking along uh, and you see that someone's collapsed with their face in a puddle, uh, given that you can turn them over and save their life, prevent them from drowning, uh, you have a duty to do so and to walk on by would be considered morally wrong. Um, so if, as a citizen, quarantine is set up so that it is an inconvenience rather than an overt threat, you have a duty to comply uh, with quarantine. Of course, that's, based, that's one of those arguments that's based on everyone being rational and having the same conception of rationality, uh, which is why it might be slightly harder to implement. Uh, and also, again, we come back to cases where of large-scale quarantine, where there is much more sort of fear and mistrust and uh, um, uh, much more uh, compulsion. So, um, you know, uh, the sort of images uh, from the last um, Ebola outbreak of an entire village uh, being placed under quarantine for, for, for three weeks after someone died, um, and that involving a curfew, uh, where people are not allowed to move from one house to another, which is enfor enforced by soldiers and the police. Um, so, so enforced by people uh, who are, by the nature of their occupations, threatening. And what is enforcement again? So, if someone breaks that curfew, are they going to be uh, asked politely to return to their home? Um, which is what I guess most of our police would do uh, from a safe distance. Uh, or are they going to be hit with a stick, or are they going to be shot? So the, this particular reference um, in terms of questions about, and again, where do, where do the discussions of quarantine arise from? So this reference, Barbera et al. in 2001, is a paper about quarantine resulting from bioterrorism. So again, we're sort of it's almost moving in, into the 21st century from that sort of instance of throwing plague bodies over the, over the wall uh, of, the, of the city. Um, so the question is to ask if you are in a position of power and you're, you're organising the last scale quarantine according to Barbera and colleagues is, uh, do, does what you know warrant the imposition of the quarantine? Uh, and again, that, that knowledge may not be total. Uh, Again, is it feasible? Can you actually do it? Because if you, if you can't actually do it, is there any point? And then finally, um, do the benefits outweigh the consequences? So if, you, if you're quarantining people, it, it, are you going to save more lives uh, than the people that are trapped together? Uh, is there going to be a riot? Um, what, are the, what are the adverse consequences? And certainly Ross Upshaw comes up with four principles. Uh, and those principles that he articulates are harm. So um, if you're implementing 
uh, for some form of quarantine, there should be a clear and measurable harm to others should a disease or exposure go unchecked, which is why we don't quarantine the common cold. This infection should be spread from person to person. So the, the response should be proportional. So public health authorities should, according to Upshur et al, um, use the least restrictive measures proportional to the goal of achieving disease control. So if you have a highly trusting population of people who are, are completely invested in their government's actions, it may be that most of it can be voluntary, um, or it could be that if you have people who uh, are likely to pay and be inconvenienced by a fine, then a fine is meaningful. If you have a large population of people who will never pay a fine, uh, if it was imposed, then a fine becomes meaningless. Uh, if you have people who are so rich that a fine is just the cost of doing business, again a fine is meaningless. There's the idea of reciprocity, so society asks individuals to curtail their liberties for the good of others, and society has a reciprocal obligation to assist them in the discharge of their obligations. So the idea of, of the returning uh, nurse uh, being uh, housed in a tent without running water, I think is absolutely shocking uh, from the point of view of a Western democracy. And then finally, there's the idea of transparency. So um, public health authorities have an obligation to communicate the justification for their actions. And that's part of a general uh, accountability for reasonableness that, that per pervades um, political philosophy uh, in the West. So we come full circle, and I hope that some of what I've said will feed into your, your thinking about what we've heard so far today uh, when we get the, uh, our, our speakers and panellists um, up to have a, a, a two-way conversation. Um, so think about how do we make um, these, these um, ideas operational. So, um, one example is a checklist for public authorities. So uh, this is my summary of uh, the CDC checklist for pandemic flu. Again, it's a very <coughs> line worth looking at. Um, they subdivide their areas of the checklist into general uh, ethical issues like what are the goals of the, the quarantine? Are they achievable? Uh, are there, is there transparency of decision making? Uh, have various people been involved. So unless you've actually involved the people whose ships you're going to stop, uh, the people whose liberties you're going to curtail, how do you know they're going to work with you? Um, issues related to data collection, again, it's interesting that this is mirroring the things that we've actually highlighted in our discussion. Issues related to liberty, but also the allocation of scarce resources. So if there's a quarantine that's large scale, then that implies that there is a disaster going on, how are you going to mobilise things fairly in a disaster uh, and how are you going to do so in a way that allows a society to continue functioning. So, apologies for the next zombie clip, uh, quip, but again, this idea of quarantine is, is an extreme thing, um, but not in, in, in the history of this country there have been sort of periods where uh, and history of Europe, there have been long periods where there has been quarantine accepted as a part of maritime life. Um, so again, how do we prepare ourselves for, for quarantine both here and elsewhere? Uh, is it about having checklists ready? Is it about having reasonable policies? What lessons can we learn from history, arts and literature? And again, how do we address the popular narrative? So how do we foster confident citizenship uh, and engagement of stakeholders? And then, is there anything that this can teach us about morality itself? So I'm completely happy for any of these um, slides to be um, posted on the Bothquiz website. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you use the agenda medic, I'm very happy to share them with individuals. So there is absolutely no need to photograph them uh, unless you wish to tweet them. Um, over to you, any questions? Thank you.
references that I've used are also open access, so you can look them up. And on the slides, if you get hold of them, there's, uh, there's uh, some online training from the Canadians and, and, a, and a, a news video that you should watch with a pinch of salt. <laughs>